Hi everyone. In this series of videos, we're going to talk a little bit about basic neuroradiology spine procedures. We'll talk a little bit about some of the indications for performing the procedures, some of the considerations you should think about before performing these procedures, and then some of the details for how to perform these procedures. So in this video, I'm going to give you an overview of some of the basic procedures that are performed in neuroradiology. We're going to talk about some of the indications for performing those procedures, what sort of risks are involved in the procedure, what sort of things you need to think about in terms of anticoagulation, and then the types of procedures that we're going to talk about mainly are going to be lumbar punctures and myelograms. Now, there's a wider range of procedures which are performed in neuroradiology, including a number of CT-guided procedures that you might uh, see including biopsy, you can perform lumbar puncture and myelogram, as well as cervical puncture under CT, and also a range of pain procedures that we can talk about uh, at a later time. But for now, we're going to stick to the more basic procedures. Now, we're going to start by talking about what you should think about before performing a procedure, including what the indications might be, what the need for the procedure is, what patient risk factors there might be, including uh, allergies and anticoagulation, and we'll talk about that in the context of lumbar puncture and myelogram. Now, whenever you're asked to perform a procedure, you need to think about what is the risk to benefit ratio of that procedure. So what is the need for the procedure and what are the generic risks? And then are there any special risks in that patient? You need to think about allergies, anticoagulation status, the size of the patient, how well the patient may be able to tolerate the procedure, and then what kind of imaging guidance you want to use to perform the procedure. Every procedure that you perform, you need to think about why you're being asked to do it. In radiology departments, the most common procedure you're going to encounter is a failed lumbar puncture, uh, where the primary team on the floor or in the emergency department could not perform it, either because the patient was large or the patient has hardware or prior surgery. You may also be asked to do a myelogram that can, that's usually asked for because you're doing a pre-surgical evaluation in a patient that has hardware. Many surgeons will now do their surgery based on the results of an MRI, but there are still some indications for looking at hardware and the fecal sac with CT. In general, when you're thinking about these procedures, the major risks are going to be infection or bleeding. I tell my patients that the risk of infection or bleeding after a procedure such as this is one in a thousand or less. The more serious but less likely risks are damage to adjacent structures, such as nerve roots, blood vessels, etc. And that's going to be quite rare. And the need for an additional procedure. For example, if you had an epidural hematoma after a procedure, you might need a surgical evacuation. But that would be quite rare, and I'm certain to tell my patients that when I'm performing the consent for the procedure. Now, whenever you're performing a procedure, you've got to think about allergies. The medications that we use are not that many. If you're doing a myelogram, you're typically doing some injected contrast, whether it's a CT contrast like OmniPIC or gadolinium agents like you might use for an MRI myelogram. A local anesthetic is typically the only medication that we use otherwise. If patients have a true allergy to contrast, they should be pre-medicated before myelogram, but uh, the true allergies are somewhat rare you should consider that patients can have cross-reactions. However, these are not real contraindications. You'll often have patients come in, say they're allergic to shellfish or shrimp, uh, topical iodine or betadine, uh, an allergy to that is not really a contrast reaction to iodinated IV contrast. You should think about whether or not uh, that allergy does kind of increase the overall general risk, but it's not so much that you should worry about it or premedicate in those situations. You can read much more about contrast usage here in the ACR contrast manual. So I definitely recommend you check that out if you have more questions about contrast usage and allergies. This is a recent article which came out on Doximity and I'll give it a little bit of a plug here. Uh, the topic is to essentially stop saying your patient's allergic to iodine. We see this so much in the patient's medical record where it's just generally saying that a patient is allergic to iodine. Uh, this is a hilarious article, and I think it's a really great article. You should check it out uh, if you have time. But uh, they're essentially saying that you 
if a patient has an allergy, you have to be specific about the allergy. And you, if a patient were allergic to penicillin, you wouldn't say they're allergic to antibiotics. Uh, penicillin is made of carbon and oxygen, and you wouldn't say that they have a carbon allergy uh, either. So uh, this is what we do when we're saying a patient's allergic to iodine. Um, iodine is a mineral. It's an element. You can't be allergic to it. Uh, I mean, you have no mechanism for having a reaction to it. And uh, without it, you will die. And uh, so if when allergies are documented, they need to not be documented as iodine. They needed to be documented as this specific iodinated agent that was injected. Unfortunately, we inherit many of these old allergies that have been documented in charts. If you do have to do premedication, there's a number of premedication regimens that you can do. And those again are covered in the ACR manual, so I'm not going to go into them in great, uh, in great detail. If a patient has had an anaphylactoid reaction where they had to be intubated because of airway closure, I would say probably don't give the contrast at all. Uh, if not, then you can think about how urgent is the need for contrast. For a myelogram, it's almost never a stat indication where you need to do it right away. So most patients are going to get this 12-hour uh, regimen here. Uh, the accelerated IV regimen is really uh, not, not something that we do often in that, in that situation, but it does exist. Here are just some descriptions of the regimen. Like the most common one you'll see is oral prednisone for three doses prior to the procedure at 13, 7, and 1 hours. And then you can give Benadryl right before the procedure. There are alternate ones which have uh, Medrol and, uh, and Benadryl. In general, uh, these are thought to be uh, equally effective, but the option one is preferred. If you're in a rush, so you need to perform a procedure immediately because the patient's going to go to the OR, you can do this with prednisone uh, right before the procedure. You should do it immediately and then every four hours until the scan, again, giving Benadryl right before. And there are alternate regimens with dexamethasone or methylprednisone. In general, you need to do these for four or five hours. There's no proven effect uh, for doing something just for one hour. Uh, there's no proven effect that that actually decreases the risk of contrast reactions. In general, however, for spine procedures, we're not injecting contrast that often. Uh, so it's just something to think about if you, if you run into that. Renal insufficiency from spine procedures, the contrast dose that you're typically injecting into the spine is so low that it's usually not going to create an issue. So it's not really something that I, that I regularly think about. Anticoagulation, on the other hand, is really a tremendous issue that you have to think about before performing a spinal procedure. There are a number of guidelines out there for how you should consider anticoagulation. I think this uh, article here from JVIR in 2012 is one of the best articles. Uh, all spinal procedures in this article are lumped into moderate risk. You do have to consider a little bit of variation uh, with the lowest risk for pain procedures. Intrathecal procedures, of course, are higher and large core biopsies are going to have the highest, but these all fall under moderate risk procedures. These are the guidelines for moderate risk procedures from that article. Here again, you see that uh, this includes all spinal procedures. Uh, so that's the one that's are included there. Here you see that uh, the management recommendations here, including correcting an INR to 1.5 or less and correcting an APTT uh, to 1.5 times the control, uh, platelets transfusing for values of less than 50,000, not checking a hematocrit, holding Plavix or clopidogrel for five days, and then uh, not worrying about aspirin or other um, anti-inflammatory drugs and then uh, low molecular weight heparin or Lovenox withholding for one dose prior to the procedure. Unfortunately, in addition to the common anticoagulants that you see, such as Coumadin, Lovenox, and heparin, there's a whole new spectrum of anticoagulants out there, many of which are orally administered and a few of which have reversal agents. They all have specific times that they should be withheld and it can be for several days. Uh, so typically, if you're going, if a patient is on any of these advanced anticoagulants, you really should look it up and see what the specific time is uh, for them, because they range anywhere from three to five days. Uh, so you definitely want to be familiar with those, but these are things that you're going to increasingly see in patients' charts. So be aware of those. 
This is a graphic from a Saturday Night Live uh, where they were advertising for Eloquist, uh, calling it Cialis for horses. I thought it was particularly funny given the number of anticoagulants that there are out there and just how common uh, they are and how strange the names are as well. So just be on the lookout for those. In summary, before you're doing a spine procedure, you need to check these things. We correct if the platelets are less than 50,000 or if the INR is greater than 1.5. Lovenox or low molecular weight heparin we hold for 12 to 24 hours. This 12 hours is for the prophylactic dose for DVT. 24 hours is for the therapeutic dose. Heparin we hold for two to four hours and then recheck a PTT. Cubidin, patients typically need to be on for five days with a bridge to heparin if needed or low molecular weight heparin. And Plavix, like typically people need to be off for five to seven days. Aspirin and NSAIDs, you don't specifically need to stop. You should consider risks if patients have other risk factors for hemorrhage, uh, such as previous hemorrhage or um, if they're on other anticoagulants. Anytime you have multiple risk factors, you increase the risk of hemorrhage after a procedure like this. Another major factor that we see commonly is the kind of increasing size of patients. The larger a patient is, the bigger the challenge. You have to use a longer needle. A longer needle tends to magnify errors because you're further away from the skin site. It's smaller uh, variation in angle makes you further away from your target. It can be harder to achieve local anesthesia. The length of the needle that comes in the procedure kit may not even be long enough to get to the muscular fascia. And then you also have logistical difficulties, including putting the patient on the table, the needle hitting the gantry or fluoroscope, depending on what kind of uh, equipment you have. So keep all of those things in mind. A final thing I want you to think about before you're doing a procedure is whether or not uh, the patient's going to be able to tolerate the procedure, whether you need to think about doing sedation. Straightforward procedures like lumbar puncture and myelogram, I tend to not use um, moderate sedation really ever. If you're doing a nerve block or a blood patch, uh, you can think about doing sedation, but they're typically, again, not going to be needed. More complex procedures like cervical nerve blocks multi-level nerve blocks, biopsies, and ablation, like you're probably going to need sedation. Anytime you want to think about the patient, though, patients tend to vary greatly in what kind of procedures they can tolerate. Many patients can uh, maybe very squirmy, moving around a lot. Other patients uh, may be very uh, tolerant of pain and can go through uh, any procedure without medication. So you just have to think about what the procedure is likely, uh, the patient's likely to tolerate. For local anesthesia, we use 1% or 2% lidocaine. Uh, you can add bicarbonate to uh, the lidocaine to decrease the pain of the injection. You want to make a skin wheel first and then numb the deeper tissues along the track. Again, if you have a larger patient, you might consider getting a larger needle uh, than what comes with the, the kit usually. There's usually like a, about a 1 or 1.5 one inch needle. Uh, for a very large patient, you might need to use a, a larger needle, like a two or a three inch needle, uh, just to even get to the muscular fascia. Once you've given the anesthesia, make sure you give the anesthesia enough time to take effect. Uh, that's a main reason why anesthesia may not give the patient any benefit is if you don't wait long enough. Then think about what kind of image guidance you need to use. The vast majority of procedures in neuroradiology are performed with fluoroscopy or conventional x-rays. These are fast, they have a relatively low radiation dose and the cost is low. You have a little bit less accuracy in determining your final needle position. So if you're doing something where you need a very uh, tight, or you have a very tight margin of getting that needle position, you might think about using CT or MR. CT has higher accuracy, but it's slower. You have a theoretically a slightly higher radiation dose but the radiation dose of the CT procedures can still be relatively low. MRI, on the other hand, does not use radiation, but again, it's slow. You have to use MR-compatible needles and devices. If the patients have any contraindication, then uh, you have to consider not doing MR or at least take account of those things. What type of imaging is used tends to vary by local practice parameters. If an institution is very comfortable with CT and has a lot of CT availability, 
people may tend to use it more, but again, fluoroscopy is the workhorse of neuroradiology procedures. The risks of these procedures, you have to think about the general risks. We talked about infection and bleeding. You want to wear a cap uh, and a mask for all of these procedures. Uh, bleeding, again, is quite low, so these risks are quite low. Damage to adjacent structures, if you hit a nerve root, you can cause an epidural hematoma uh, or a superficial hematoma, so uh, those things can be, can be caused. You should think about specific risks after specific types of procedures. If you're puncturing the thecal sac, you have to think about headache and CSF leak and epidural hematoma. If you're doing a pain procedure, the biggest risk, I mean, this is not a risk necessarily so much or an adverse event, but the patient simply may not get improvement of their pain, which is something that you have to consider. Cervical procedures, you've got to think about vascular injury because the carotid arteries and vertebral arteries are very close to the area where you're doing your procedure. You always want to wear protective attire. Uh, for us, we wear glo sterile gloves, a mask, and a cap for all of the procedures which are considered clean, like lumbar punctures and myelograms. For biopsies, you tend to wear the previous and uh, also gown up for those because of the slightly increased risk of infection in a deep procedure such as that. Thanks for tuning in today. Up next, we'll have a video discussing lumbar punctures and myelograms. We'll talk a little bit more about how the procedures are performed and some of the more specific considerations for those procedures. Thank you for watching our video today. If you enjoyed it, I hope you'll check out our other videos on our channel. Click here to subscribe or check out our website on learnerradiology.com.